Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk, Performance is Witness, Recognizing the Rhetoric that Leads to Violence, features our special guest, Dr. Alexander Hinton, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Director of the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights, and UNESCO Chair on Genocide Prevention at Rutgers University. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York, is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Today's event is part of a special collaboration between the Kupferberg Holocaust Center and QCC CUNY's LGBTQIA consortium in a semester-long project entitled Performances Prevention. Our event is co-sponsored by the Holocaust, Genocide, and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, and the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University. After the presentation, please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming Professor Heather Huggins, Associate Professor of Speech, Communication, and Theater Arts, and Coordinator of the LGBTQIA Plus Consortium's Performance as Prevention Project. Professor Huggins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura. I also want to extend our appreciation to Marissa Hollywood, Associate Director of the KHC, who is supporting today's webinar. My name is Heather Huggins, and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Communication, Theater, and Media Production at Queensboro. Last year, I was a Charles E. Scheidt Faculty Fellow at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention at Binghamton University. I learned about the urgent need for multidisciplinary engagement in prevention. And as a former community college student, this IGMAP experience inspired me to reflect about access and inclusion and our multi multicultural, multilingual community here at Queensboro. This led to an ongoing collaboration with my colleague and department chairperson, C. Julian Jimenez, who is also here with us today. We discussed ways to develop programming with a prevention lens. We first imagined creating a program around the film Bent as a way to engage with identity-based violence that links the past and the present. As we spoke with colleagues at QCC about our ideas, we were encouraged to apply for the grant with the CUNY LGBTQIA consortium. This award is what supported us in creating this spring series on performance as prevention. We've had events highlighting the role of artists and the arts in intervening and responding to identity-based violence, including the Holocaust, Martin Luther King Jr.'s 1963 imprisonment in Birmingham, and the 1990 murder of Julio Rivera in Jackson Heights. All of this programming is also a collaboration with QCC's three campus cultural centers, the Harriet and Kenneth Kupperberg Holocaust Center, the Queensboro Performing Arts Center, and the QCC Art Gallery. Today's event, Performances Witness, Recognizing the Rhetoric that Leads to Violence, is the last event in this Performance as Prevention series. We invited Dr. Alexander Hinton for a discussion about how the rise of political extremism and hate speech contributes to a growing atmosphere of insecurity and dehumanization in our society. Dr. Hinton will also reflect about the engagement of performance in coming to terms with antisemitism, racism, and transphobia through the lens of the works in the Spring 2024 series. Last week, the KHC and QPAC hosted a performance of Letters from Ann and Martin, which weaves verbatim texts from Anne Frank's diary with Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. Earlier in March, we had a screening of the film Bent, and in February, there were free public performances of Julio going down like that. 
At the start of the series, we also screened the documentary, Julio of Jackson Heights, which features community members who were impacted by the murder of Julio Rivera. Each of these projects were developed by artists with archival materials. This is the landscape for today's event. And we're grateful that Dr. Hinton will share his presence and expertise so we can reflect on the themes presented in these works and their relevance to today. Dr. Alexander Hinton is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology, Director of the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights, and UNESCO Chair on Genocide Prevention at Rutgers University. He is the author or editor of 17 books, including the award-winning Why Did They Kill? Cambodia in the Shadow of Genocide. His most recent books are It Can Happen Here, White Power and the Rising Threat of Genocide in the U.S., Anthropological Witness, Lessons from the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, and Perpetrators, Encountering Humanity's Dark Side. His recent research explores two myths fueling the conservative right's dangerous transphobia. We've asked Dr. Hinton to share a presentation, and then we'll begin our discussion. Welcome, Dr. Hinton. Hello, uh, greetings to all, uh, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I am going to attempt to get a PowerPoint share going. So yeah, you know, uh, first of all, what a remarkable uh, program. I really am in awe of it uh, and, uh, you know, traversing history and different contexts and different issues. Um, you know, the scope is remarkable. Uh, the scope uh, also is somewhat daunting to have to try and sort of pull it all together. Um, so, you know, thinking through that, I decided to hone in uh, on one issue that provides a thread and a way to think through uh, connections. Uh, so I'm going to do that here today. Um, you know, before we begin, uh, I just want to offer my thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, the Professor uh, Huggins, uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, as well as uh, Professor Jimenez and Marissa Hollywood, uh, and everyone else who's been involved as someone who also runs a center. I know how much uh, time, effort, and work go into uh, pulling off events. I've attended actually some of the events here and I've always been impressed as well. Uh, so anyways, it's an honor to be here and to be a part of it. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, dive into things. So, if we sort of go back in time a little bit, and again, I find this with my students, I'm always like, oh, remember Charlottesville? Uh, and then the students stare at me blankly, or, you know, and I say, oh, yeah, you were really young at that time. You know, so it seems like yesterday, but uh, anyways, 2017. Uh, especially with the pandemic is a, uh, is a ma major interruption between, uh, goes back a ways. But for those uh, who are a little bit older, um, or maybe back in middle school were very attuned to the news, uh, you know, Charlottesville looms large. Um, this was a Unite the Right rally shortly after uh, then President Trump uh, had won the election. Uh, and suddenly on the streets of Charlottesville, um, a number of far-right extremists uh, had a protest. Uh, they called it Unite the Right for a very specific reason. Um, and suddenly, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, what is, what is going on? Where did these people come from? Why are they marching in the city streets? Uh, and then if we jump forward to something that I'm sure everyone remembers, because it's closer, uh, we have the January 6th insurrection. So a little bit of what I'm going to be doing is to uh, create a thread between those two events and weave it on into the present. Um, you know, so I have different spaces of research and a lot on Cambodia before. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that during this presentation, um, but maybe we can during the Q&A. Uh, I also... You know, this book, It Can Happen Here, uh, and I continue to do research into the present, uh, and uh, maybe I'll speak a bit about that as well. <clears throat> so, you know, Charlottesville, one of the things that was very strange for many of us uh, was this thing people were saying. Uh, you know, they got on, they were marching, and they said, you will not replace us. 
or Jews will not replace us. And this was a chant. You know, they said things like, you know, whose streets are streets, which you can hear in many different uh, sorts of demonstrations. Uh, and they chanted blood and soil. But the thing that sounded odd, well, it all sounded somewhat odd, but the you will not replace us was something many people, perhaps most people, almost certainly most people were not familiar with. And it sounded odd and they didn't know what, quite what to make of it. Well, so, you know, what do we do? Trying to understand something. I always like, this is my favorite, uh, one of my favorite essays, one I always use in teaching, um, but the philosopher Theodore Adorno uh, has an uh, essay they gave as a radio address called Education After Auschwitz. Uh, and he says, you know, the premier demand upon education is that Auschwitz not happen again. And by that, he didn't, wasn't speaking in particular and specifically about not about Germany, but he was speaking uh, for the potential to genocide, for genocide to happen uh, anywhere. Uh, and so the sort of drivers of it continued into the present. In keeping with that, you know, after Charlottesville, people had this question, you know, why did this happen? And the New York, there was one article that came out in the New York Times, uh, and they interviewed this guy, Tony Hoveter, uh, who's a member of the Traditionalist Workers' Party. Uh, and the Richard Fawcett, the uh, journalist, went out and hung out with him for a couple of days and tried to figure out what was going on, what led him to march at Charlottesville. Um, and as you can see from you know, the title of the article, The Voice of Hate Next Door, but really, you know, he found he's the Nazi sympathizer next door, but he's polite, low key. Um, and this article caused an enormous amount of controversy. Um, it, a lot of people said, oh, you're trying to normalize neo-Nazis. How could you say he's normal, ordinary like us? Uh, and so other newspapers picked up on this and criticized the New York Times. Then Faustus, the author, did a follow-up article, as they sometimes have in the New York Times, uh, where he talked about writing the article, uh, and he you know, invoked Citizen Kane, the film, at one point, um, saying, where's the rosebud? Uh, but at the end, it ended up by invoking the title of a punk rock album, uh, and, it's, and it ends with, it's titled, What Makes a Man Start Fires? So I'm going to sort of pick up his question. So he said he ultimately really couldn't come up with a full explanation. And he wondered, you know, what makes a man start fires, quote unquote. Well, about a year later, uh, you know, people were asking that question again, uh, when Robert Bowers uh, went into Tree of Life Synagogue, uh, killed um, 11 Jews there. Um, and anyways, he posted uh, on social media, but really, this just was part of a long string of attacks that have taken place into the present. Um, you know, I have this one by Gendron in Buffalo, uh, where he attacked a tops that was frequented by Black Americans. Um, but we actually had another one uh, in, that you may remember in Jacksonville uh, at a dollar store. Uh, and the person went in there targeting uh, Black Americans again. Uh, and that was in 2023, but they now start to kind of uh, squelch those. And those are just the ones uh, in the U.S. Uh, you know, so within this timeline, we have all the different far right extremist symbols uh, that appeared uh, at the uh, January 6th insurrection. And so we have this problematic in the U.S. I could easily create uh, something like this for Europe as well, going back to Anders Breivik, the Christ Future. Christchurch shooter, uh, and so forth. Um, but just within the U.S., we have this sort of through line. And again, this question, you know, how could it happen here? Um, I'm, part of what I'm going to draw on uh, comes from my book. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, white genocide and maybe conclude with the bird. So I'm going to organize uh, my remarks uh, around four different um thematics. Uh, the first one is the hater, another is a twisted gun, uh, the third is a bad apple, and the fourth uh, is an open window. So let's begin with the hater. So what happens after there are uh, you know, attacks? You get this question, why did it happen? How could it happen here? Uh, and pretty quickly, we get uh, labels, uh, and almost always 
the word evil is invoked, uh, sick, demented, uh, anti-Semite. And this was language that then President Trump invoked. But, uh, you know, after we had Gendron, um, you know, uh, President Biden used similar language and invoked similar explanations. So this is sort of a go-to answer to that question, you know, quote unquote, why does a man start fires? What makes a man start fires? Uh, these quick one word uh, explanations. Similarly, uh, during the Capitol insurrection, uh, you know, I, different people came out. We, of course, uh, had some characters who were the, the Q shaman uh, in particular. You can see at the top on that, that photo uh, who were invoked. And, you know, this article came out, I think it was in the Atlantic uh, and, you know, had a bunch of caricatures um, deadbeat dad, you porn enthusiast, slow students, uh, so on and so forth, bellies full of beer, McMuffins, high on Adderall. Um, the Confederate flag, of course, sort of suggests everyone was from the South or had a link to the South. So we get a lot of uh, essentializing as well that goes on with uh, explanations uh, of the insurrectionists. So, you know, this is a little... Uh, cartoon graphic that is linked to that philosopher Adorno. Um, and uh, it talks about this idea of reification or thingification, where people are turned into things, one word explanations. Um, so you see on the, uh, hopefully your left side, uh, Robert Bowers uh, being presented like the insurrectionists as haters, uh, racist, anti-Semites, so on and so forth. And you see in the backdrop, uh, uh, pizza guy, as we say, right? So a complex human is reduced to a pizza guy. And on the other side, this uh, graphic from the uh, the journal Logos has a picture of sort of unpacking what it means uh, with Bauer, the insurrectionist. And so this is un can be uncomfortable um, because there's always a deflection that goes on uh, that suggests people like that aren't anything like me, they're different, they're a different sort of person. Uh, and this happens over and again, we get this going back to the title of my book, you know, this is not who we are, it can happen here, but over and over again, obviously uh, it does. So if we try to do a bit of unpacking then, uh, we can start with uh, Bowers, um, you know, what were his, some of his motivations? So, uh, he used a social media platform that's large, that's often used by far right extremists, um, and it's called Gab. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, and so, on his Gab account, Robert Bowers uh, had different things. You can see the one thing says "Make Ovens 1488 uh, Again," you know, playing off MAGA as a slogan. Uh, but if you look up on his homepage. Uh, you see that there is a, a, a speed radar. And on that radar gun, you have the numbers 1488. And again, as I just said, they appear below, make ovens 1488 again. Uh, so we have this four digit code that offers uh, you know, a clue uh, into his motivations, not necessarily his only motivations, but at least some of them. So to understand this four-digit code, uh, you know, we need to go back uh, into uh, white power extremist history. Um, there are different landing points. Um, one landing point uh, is with a philosopher turned extremist named uh, William Pierce. Uh, he formed a group called the National Alliance. It was uh, maybe the most well-known uh, group in his day. He was originally a member of the American Nazi party, uh, left it uh, and formed his group. Uh, and by the 1970s, uh, he began to write uh, in serial form what later became a book called The Turner Diary. Some of you may be familiar with it. And actually until recently, you could buy it on Amazon. Uh, and they would direct you, of course, to things like Mein Kampf. But, uh, you know, the FBI has called it the Bible uh, of the racist right. Some have called it white supremacist scripture. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, it begins actually with gun control. Uh, and Turner joins a secretive group called the Order. 
uh, and they set out uh, eventually to topple the quote unquote Zionist uh, occupied government, um, so Jewish controlled government, and they proceed to uh, kill uh, all people of color uh, in the United States. Uh, they also kill race traders, um, and those race traders are killed on the day of the rope. So sometimes, including at the Capitol insurrection, uh, you see a noose and and white power extremist circles, uh, it directly uh, harkens uh, and reflects this book, The Turner Diaries. So in the end, you know, you're not going to read it. So I'll just tell you what happens. They take over not just the U.S., but the entire world uh, and kill all people of color, annihilate Israel, uh, and of course, kill all Jews, uh, who are the enemy number one. Uh, and they create this uh, white world. And the book actually is set in the future, looking back uh, and thinking about the time of this uh, quote unquote glorious revolution. So, yeah, there's kind of a, you know, can go on a long time about this history. Uh, so, as I said, he wrote a book, uh, Pierce did call uh, in the Turner Diaries. He spoke about quote unquote the order, that was the group that takes over the world. Um, there actually was a group of far right extremists who cr actually created a group called the Order. Uh, that was linked to Pierce's vision. And one of those uh, people, one of the members, they went around to things like rob banks and they would give the money to different far right extremist organizations, uh, but they wanted to topple the US government. They didn't get very far. Um, one member uh, of that group uh, was uh, David E. Lane, uh, and he was arrested and eventually sent to jail. Uh, and in the 1980s, while he was in jail, uh, you know, picking up and inspired in part uh, by, by Pierce, uh, he wrote the White Genocide Manifesto. Um, you know, and for those who've read Marx and the notion of false consciousness, uh, you know, this work picks up on that idea and says there's false consciousness. But in this case, people are brainwashed not to understand uh, that the U.S. is controlled by a quote unquote Zionist occupied, so Zionist occupied government, uh, and that the white population face a uh, dire threat of white genocide. Um, so he begins by talking about the system, and then he prevents, you know, it's a revelation about what goes on, and he has a number of different points in the manifesto, and then they have a response. <laughs> so I want to go over some of the points because they uh, loop back into the larger themes uh, uh, of uh, your speaker series. Um, so, you know, in terms of anti-Semitism, as you've already heard, uh, you know, this document's loaded with it. Um, you know, at the top, uh, point six, uh, Western nations are all ruled by a Zionist conspiracy to mix, overrun, and exterminate uh, the white race, uh, the quote unquote uh, Zog, as it's called, uh, controls the media and all the levers of power. Uh, it ties into the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, you know, it talks about the Zionist destroyer, um, as well as this idea that the government wants to, or the uh, Zionist occupied governments, they want to kill white babies uh, through abortion. Um, so you can see how different social issues begin to be woven in. Um, in terms of this calculus, and again, he talks constantly about nature and natural law, um, race war, survival of the fittest, uh, a number of the usual tropes you find in far-right extremist circles. Um, but here are a couple of things. So we think of uh, contemporary uh, discussions of immigration, which also date far back uh, in U.S. history, uh, but you can see the white remnant uh, submerge, right? A tidal wave of uh, 5 billion people of color. Um, they're going to become extinct uh, as well. Uh, you know, the result of uh, attempts to desegregate and have uh, racial integration, right, is uh, policies like miscegenation uh, that lead to the diminishment of white babies, the decrease in the number. Uh, and it, uh, all different policies linked to this, uh, busing, so on and so forth, uh, he says are all uh, promoting ultimately white genocide. Uh, it also uh, ha is very gendered. Um, 
uh, one of the key phrases on point six, uh, you know, it's the instinct of white men to preserve the beauty of their women and a future for white children on this earth. It's ordained by nature. Um, up above the life of the race, of races in the wombs of women. Uh, and so they're critical for uh, the group to demographically continue. And of course, uh, in this logic, uh, it's the Zog, Zionist occupied government, uh, that's responsible for this. Uh, and he talks a lot about homosexuality uh, and how it's, uh, you know, quote unquote, degenerate and doesn't lead to the proper propagation of the race. Uh, and so that's a common theme uh, as well. So you can see that uh, gender and homophobia uh, are very prominent uh, and different iterations in the present have now focused on uh, transphobia uh, literally into uh, the present uh, present moment um, which maybe I'll, I'll come back to um, yeah so here's the idea we've got the system uh, the revelation which it gives uh, with these different points of his manifesto um, lead to the response and so we have a sort of diffuse idea of white genocide in, in Pierce's book and uh, the Turner Diaries. And we get a new iteration, uh, you know, a decade later now with Lane. Um, and he comes up and, you know, in his little three page tract, three or four page tract, and bullface, uh, he says, you know, people need to rise up. Race traders are going to, you know, they're going to face uh, what they deserve, justice as they deserve. You think back to the day of the rope. Uh, but then in, you know, sort of stand out all caps, he says, you know, we must adhere to this principle. And you saw it as well alluded to uh, when I talked about the point on gender. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. And so this is known as the 14 words. If we go back to the calculus, right? You think about how uh, this white power ideology uh, functions, right? You have the symptom, what you can sort of see, you see evidence of the destruction of, of, of the white race. Um, and if you go back to the root causes, uh, you know, this Jewish conspiracy, is it the part of it in part? Um, but the 14 words, if we go back to the four digit code, the 14 of Robert Bauer's radar gun is the 14 words. Uh, and so you frequently see people with 1488 tattoos or 14 tattoos. Uh, and I'll show you one other example of that uh, a little bit later. So that's 19, uh, you know, the 1980s. This slogan uh, has circulated all over. It's, you know, if you see it all over the place, including with Tony Hoveter, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But if we jump forward to Charlottesville, where suddenly people became familiar with this new term, the alt-right, uh, which is actually now faded a little bit, um, but that was Richard Spencer, uh, was he claimed to have actually invented the term. Um, he and some other associates, uh, associates created their own little manifesto for the alt-right. Uh, and in the introduction, uh, they say, what are the basic principles? Um, well, you know, race is real got to pay attention to demography demography uh, and the decline of the white race. Two, right, we're back to the Zog, Zionist occupied government, the Jewish question is valid. Three, right back with Pierce, white genocide's underway. Um, and then in that introduction, he says, if you want to distill it, you know, it can be distilled by the 14 words. So that's, again, uh, another example of how this idea of the 14 words continues. Um, if we jump ahead <clears throat> to the uh, Buffalo shooter, uh, Peyton Gendron, um, he again uh, said, what do you want? And he invokes the 14 words. We must ensure the existence of our people uh, and a future for white children that dropped out there. Um, and he also talks about replacement and he speaks about it. Uh, at the same time, he talks about uh, genocide. And so again, this idea of replacement that Gendron mentions, we see being invoked, which is new for many people. Part of the genealogy comes out of Europe, uh, uh, 2015 with the mass, uh, with the immigration crisis. Uh, but it 
dates back to uh, Anders Breivik uh, and, and others. Uh, and there's this genealogy in Europe, but it also dates back to Nazi Germany and has strong roots and currents in the U.S. Uh, you know, you can take it far back to sort of uh, mid uh, 19th century nativism and even beyond. So I'm going to have four points, time permitting, uh, so little takeaways for you. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, that in thinking about far right extremists, right, the extremist is more than a hater or a racist, anti-Semite, homophobe, evil person, so on and so forth. They have motivations. They make moral claims. They have a moral economy. It doesn't mean they're moral actors. It means they're using moral logics to justify what they're doing. Uh, and one of those is this idea of a uh, key one uh, is the idea of white genocide uh, and replacement. Um, so I'll go a little more quickly uh, through the rest of these. Uh, and that's sort of the main point I wanted to get across. So if I run out of time, I can I can uh, draw to a close. Um, but let's go briefly to the twisted gun. So if we go back to Robert Bauer's Tree of Life, um, you know, as I said before, if you begin to look at his social media, uh, he had all sorts of messaging going on, uh, you know, in this one that got a lot of press, uh, attention in the press. He said, Jews are the children of Satan. Uh, and he also talks about uh, how it's liking to bring in invaders that kill our people. I can't stand by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics. I'm going in. He wrote that, posted that right before uh, he commenced his attack. Um, you know, and he says below, I know some change people are saying illegals, uh, that now they now uh, say invaders. He likes that. And of course, we have the Walmart attack that comes the following year in 2019, uh, which is all directed at um, the southern border, uh, you know, talk about invaders. This is also linked to the midterm. Um, you know, but we talk about communication. Uh, this is a little aside. They did research. They found out that uh, one of the gab friends of uh, Bowers was Jeffrey Clark. Uh, and there was a post, this is dry run for things to come. And then you find, if you begin to dive into it, they found a flyer for the uh, extreme far right group, Autumn Waffen, uh, that's accelerationist, uh, you know, seeking to start a racial holy war. Uh, you know, some literature in the home of uh, the Clarks when they went there. They talked to some family members and they've said, hey, oh, yeah, you know, they send their room playing the game ethnic cleansing a lot. Ethnic cleansing is actually a game that was invented by National Alliance way before people were doing a lot of gaming. And so, again, you can see these historical connections. Uh, if you look on the left, you can see a noose. And as I mentioned before, Day of the Rope uh, hanging, uh, as well as the long history uh, KKK and other vigilante uh, violence. Um, anyway, so you can see, again, you have these connections um, and the spread of ideas, tropes of blood and sorrow that circulate online, uh, also are being chanted uh, at Charlottesville. Uh, Gendron, uh, the uh, Buffalo top shooter, is interesting uh, because he like the Christchurch shooter uh, and others was really radicalized uh, largely online. Um, back before social media, people met more in person, though far-right extremists uh, were actually very early users um, uh, of the internet uh, doing message boarding uh, back in, I think, the 1980s even. Um, but the Buffalo uh, shooter, uh, you know, he became radicalized first on 4chan, which is far right extremist message board, um, image board. But he went on there and he actually saw a video of um, of the Christchurch shooter. And he suddenly said, I was enlightened uh, and he began to see a way. And so, you know, 4chan was one influence. He also used Reddit, Discord. He live streamed on Twitch. Uh, he looked on YouTube for instructional videos. Uh, so he says, you know, I had many influences, uh, but, you know, I'm the one who decided to do it. Um, if you look at his gun, uh, you can see up at the top, 14, 14 words. Uh, you see Anders Breivik, uh, Trant, uh, the Christchurch shooter, Dylan Roof, uh, and other uh, different sorts of uh, things that speak to what he was doing. So often when 
in the press. Uh, historically, we've had far right extremist shootings. Uh, people have said, oh, they're lone wolves. And this language uh, sometimes is still used. <clears throat> but as we've seen, uh, you know, there's actually a lot of networking uh, that goes on uh, and they're actually uh, very organized. So this is the second point uh, I wanted to make is that uh, people like Gendron may act alone or Bowers, but they're not lone wolves. They're part of a network that both synergizes in terms of beliefs, like the 14 words, but also on different uh, online spaces, ranging from online gaming uh, to uh, places like 4chan, Akun, uh, and other, other networks, Discord, uh, Reddit, all, all sorts of different places, and Telegram. And I was going to mention Telegram because at one point I was going to provide, you know, I follow a number of groups, uh, including on Telegram, uh, including Proud Boys, uh, and I was going to maybe read uh, what they're saying um, about the transgender community, but it's actually what I saw today was too offensive to read you something that was uh, immediate. Uh, so I'm just going to skip that, uh, but you get that idea. So there's on these Telegram, for example, that, you know, I'm following this every day. There's something new. You go to, uh, 4chan, which I did yesterday. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff on border invasion. Uh, so this is ongoing. People talk, they interact, uh, they post. It's a, it's a networked uh, community. So three, uh, the bad apple. And I want to go back to Adorno briefly. Uh, he talked about this idea I mentioned before, reified consciousness, which is, again, thingification, that boulder. You take, for example, a complex human being and you turn them into a thing. Um, and Adorno says in this essay, Education After Auschwitz, <clears throat> that to rupture this way of thinking, you need to, uh, people need to be taught to think historically and also to denaturalize uh, that uh, which they take for granted. And he ultimately says, uh, you know, he was uh, what I often call a depressed Marxist. He knew there'd be no communist revolution, but he wanted people to understand the social and economic forces uh, that create their sense of self, their identity, uh, and what's often called in more philosophical circles, their subjectivity. Um, and the way to do it was to always denaturalize uh, and to think historically. So... You know, in keeping with this, well, so we go back to the Charlottesville uh, haters, racist, uh, and, you know, that speaks to something. But if we think, trying to understand who they were, you know, one initial division is to understand that there were different groups. Uh, some were anti-government militias, uh, as well as white power extremists. <clears throat> if we go to the white power groups, and again, this is why I mentioned before, it's important to you know, be aware of this is called Unite the Right. And so they created uh, this poster and they actually listed all of their different groups that are united. And what's really the key point about this in Charlottesville as a, as a sort of catalyzing moment is that you have groups that historically are looked at kind of isolated and different, right? Having different agendas. Um, you know, if you go to National Socialists versus KKK, though there are historical connections there as well, or the alt-right, um, they're coming together and they, they're united in a certain sort of message. And one of the key connectors there is the 14 words, the notion of white genocide. Um, and so ideologically, you get this common ground that's absolutely essential. But as opposed to being disparate, they're coming together. But there are a number of different groups, each of which have different histories. If we shift to uh, the capital insurrection, uh, again, the groups shift. Uh, militias are a little more pronounced. QAnon is massive. QAnon barely existed back in 2017. Uh, and then you also have Christian nationalists uh, and different Trump diehards who are there. So again, and all of the part of uh, what Adorno is calling for, and for, wants all of us to do is to unpack as opposed to making uh, generalizations. The second thing that uh, this idea of reification to de-reify um, is to think historically and to understand that these groups have distinct uh, formations in the present, but they have these long histories that go back in time. 
you know, going back all the way to 1492, not just 1619. Uh, you know, so turn of the century, uh, of the 20th century, uh, we had notions of race suicide that very much echo uh, the idea of white genocide. We also had eugenics that was very strong in the U.S. And you had different currents in the U.S. that informed Nazi Germany, uh, where, you know, people which is much more associated with eugenics. Um, yeah, so there's this long history uh, of uh, far right extremism, white power extremism in the U.S. And so you can't take these groups and think of them as just sort of uh, an aberration. Another way to look at the shift over time, and I might talk about this uh, a little bit later, uh, you see different iterations of these movements that are really catalyzed by social media. So the point, uh, again, uh, to underscore is that uh, these groups, Charlottesville was not an exception. It was a symptom of something that already existed. So this is the third point, uh, is that uh, far-right extremism, moments like Charlottesville, capital insurrection, are not aberrations, they're not exceptions, they're a symptom of something that exists in deeper histories and need to be recognized as such. Um, yeah, so the last point, uh, and I will probably skip uh, the, the, la the section that follows, um, is about uh, the window so again, we've had the hater, the twisted gun symbolizing networking, the idea of the bad apple as opposed to the bad barrel, the system that's bad. It's not just the individual um, and the window. So what do I mean by the window? Um, the window refers to the Overton, what's sometimes called in uh, far right circles, uh, the right, right wing circles, the Overton window as this idea that there, uh, and it speaks to reality, there's always uh, sort of, if you think about an envelope um, or a sliding scale of what we can say. And so there are things that are politically acceptable and they're politically unacceptable and socially acceptable and unacceptable. And so remember, I said before, if we go back to uh, Charlottesville and, you know, you will not replace us, use, nobody had any idea what that what that was. So, and there's a lot that can be said on this. And it dates back to Adorno uh, and cultural Marxism and all sorts of different things that I won't get into. But basically, for many years, uh, far right extremists have viewed themselves in what they call a metapolitical battle uh, with those who promote ideas of, for example, tolerance, human rights. And this is where you get the discourse of quote unquote globalism uh, that is a big current. And this in this battle, they want to shift and mainstream what was formerly unacceptable to be acceptable. And so if you went back to 2017 and thought about what was acceptable to say and not say, and you look at what's acceptable now, uh, the discourses of the far right, many of them have been mainstreamed, including, and importantly, the idea of, of uh, 14 words and white genocide through uh, the phrasing replacement. Um, I don't think I have it here, um, but 80 million people in the US uh, believe in a sort of light to a heavy form of replacement theory. Um, think about that, 80 million people. Um, how did it happen? Well, Tucker Carlson uh, was front and center trying to promote the idea of replacement. Um, oh yeah, I should probably say. So the if you go back to Lane, he talks about this Jewish-led conspiracy uh, to undertake a demographic reduction and erasure of white people. The idea of replacement, uh, the soft form, is promoted by a number of GOP politicians, uh, including Elise Stefanik and others who make comments about how Democrats are orchestrating uh, the dem uh, replacement of, and the code is, Republican who are voters who are predominantly uh, white. And so you get uh, sort of dog whistles that are invoked. Sometimes this is said more directly, sometimes less directly. Um, but this uh, idea of replacement, you know, people know about it, it's mainstream, and then you get the fringe of it, which is uh, attacks like Gendron or the dollar uh, shooter that I mentioned before. Um, in addition, it's something that uh, was a thread not the only thread, obviously, but a thread uh, in the rhetoric uh, sort of, of the uh, the Trump administration 
uh, and there are other things I could sort of go into, I'll, I'll skip it. But just to say, um, you know, if you're trying to mobilize voters and you look at the Trump voters and you think they're uh, 70 some odd million, uh, over half of them, let's say 50 to 60 percent uh, are Republicans. Maybe they're holding the nose and vote for Trump Republicans, uh, libertarians, what have you, voting for them. Then you get another chunk of, say, uh, and again, these are off the top of my head. They sort of align with what people found, but I'm, I don't have the statistics in front of me. So do your own research and find out exactly. But if we then take and go under, maybe there are 30 million uh, people who lean towards hard or soft forms of MAGA. And then within that, you have another uh, cluster uh, of people who are sort of far right extremists. Uh, you know, how many estimates have gone from 10, 20 uh, up to 30 million of people that have sort of far right, hard far right uh, tendencies, including those who are said to have uh, what was famously found to be in a study uh, called an authoritarian personality, 10% of the U.S. population. That was back in the 1950s. Um, but you have these different umbrellas. So the reason I mention this is obviously politicians are aware of that, and they try and mobilize all these different voters it's not totally, it's more acceptable, but not to, totally acceptable to mobilize people on the far hard right. So it's often done indirectly through uh, what are called uh, dog whistles. Uh, so you remember like uh, President Candidate Trump said, uh, talked about immigrants poisoning the blood of our country recently. Uh, that's one example, but uh, there are others. So there are things that, you know, which is something that echoes uh, Nazi uh, ideology, but it's not directly made. Um, the connection. So that's an example. But <clears throat> this is uh, so on the campaign trail, and this is something I talk about uh, in my book. Um, Trump uh, told the parable of the snake. He actually told this again uh, in February. And so he's still telling it on the campaign trail. But the essence of it is that there's a woman, it's a plan in Aesop's fable, who finds a snake that's about to die. She takes in the snake, takes it back home, nurses it back to help. And then she comes home one day from work and the snake is poisonous, bites her and she dies. She says, well, you know, why did you bite me? I'm going to die. And the snake says, well, you knew I was a snake. And so Trump will often say, this is about immigration. This is about Islamic terrorists. But the idea here is, right, the poisonous foreigner coming in, biting the white woman, and we think back to Lane and the gender ideology, uh, which is essential for the propagation of the white race. Um, so you have a basically a white genocide parable uh, that can be read in different ways, but it is a dog whistle as well to the uh, uh, two uh, far right extremists. So this is another way to sort of lay it out um, in terms of white genocide. Um, yeah, so just to wrap up, uh, last little bit here. Uh, if we look at the capital insurrectionists, a huge number of them were actually <clears throat> found to had white replacement or great replacement uh, as an important factor uh, in their motivations. Um, in New Jersey, and I will just end with, I won't talk much about uh, my CPAC research, um, but I'll note that this idea of replacement is a <clears throat> idea that can contain a lot. And so you can see many different issues that tie into it. Um, so you have <clears throat> CRT and DEI, right, as a form of trying to replace civil Western civilization, the uh, you know heritage of the U.S. 1776, uh, by choosing to focus on 1619. And therefore, indirectly, it's a diminishment of, uh, you know, the white population, education, cultural Marxism, but also transgender. Uh, and you <clears throat> already have a, you know, a link into uh, that from David Lane and his attacks, which basically says that people engaged in, quote unquote, deviant activity, and often you'll find them referred to as, quote unquote, degenerates. Uh, and again, gen, gene, uh, you know, that's that etymology it ties in. Um, that fits right into the notion of replacement because instead of propagating the white race and doing what's natural, right, they're going away from that. Uh, so especially with the emphasis on woke, uh, wokeism, woke ideology, uh, there's been this massive attack on the uh, transgender community 
<clears throat> and I was when I went to CPAC, uh, that's the, sorry, the Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, which is a main gathering of religious uh, conservatives and sometimes has people from the far right uh, who participate. Um, but this was a massive theme last year. I went again this year and it was still a theme, um, but I was I was actually shocked. So I wrote two articles about what I uh, found. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there, uh, even though I could probably go on for a long time. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to talk a bit more. And I have other stuff I was ready to talk about that I didn't. So maybe I'll weave it into the conversation. Dr. Hinton, thank you so much. Um your presentation and the research that you've been doing, especially contextualizing past to present and the political shifts that are happening in our country and the demographic shifts that are happening, you've really encapsulated it in a way that I think is really relevant and important for our audience, both community members and students. And I have a question because, you, you know, a lot of the conversation is around um, the white nationalist movement. And I know you're aware of Eric Ward, who wrote a very important article um, that talks about how anti-Semitism underpins white nationalism and racism. And part of the series, we were looking historically um, either in the sort of the Nazi past or in the 50s and the 60s um, and even up to today. Could you talk a little bit about how and why anti-Semitism right now is raging in ways that feel very similar, but are also kind of different to what happened with anti-Semitism um, during World War II and the Nazis' use of it? Yeah, that's a uh, it's a really good question. It's a big question. Um, maybe the way to tackle it uh, is to again, if we go back to this metaphor I used of sort of soft and hard uh, replacement theory, and think about anti-Semitism in the same way. <clears throat> there are different forms of sort of everyday, indirect, maybe sometimes even not really knowingly being used anti-Semitism, and then they're really hard forms of it, right? And so if we look at <clears throat> David Lane, right, he's espousing hard forms of it. Uh, but there's every more casual, everyday anti-Semitism that exists. And so if you think of that backdrop of what everyday anti-Semitism does, and it can be made in casual remarks between different people, um, that lays a basis for within moments of heightened tension, for it to be moved more towards the sort of hard forms of it. So obviously with Gaza, right, there's been both a spike of Islamophobia, but also extreme anti-Semitism, both of those at the same time. Um, so, you know, and why is that? Well, part of it plays into these tropes that exist, that circulate uh, and are commonplace. Um, you know, and that's why many different organizations and people working uh, you know, in Holocaust education, genocide education, uh, attempt to sort of attack those uh, everyday forms uh, of anti-Semitism and hate directed against other groups as well. <clears throat> if we loop that around to uh, Adorno, right, and that notion of reification, when we label people, right, as certain types of people, and then we affix certain identities, right, that's not a good thing. We're sort of back to hater thinking, reification. And the challenge is always to make things more complex. Adorno was Jewish. Um, I should note uh, as well, which is why he was called a cultural Marxist and he's hated by uh, a lot of people on the far right. But, you know, one example uh, for those who are familiar with uh, the graphic narrative mouse, uh, maybe you've had an event on it or something linked to it before or students have read it. <clears throat> but there's a scene where so Mouse is a graphic narrative uh, written by a son who's a graphic artist about his father, uh, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, uh, and he begins to you know, sort of get his father's story. Uh, father tells a story at one point after the Nazis have taken over, they're on the run, they're in Poland. Um, and the father tells how he was walking along, he was passing, if you will, as Polish, and a Polish child turned pointed at him and said, look, a Jew, a Jew. And so you think in that very moment, he went from being an, you know, viewed by most people <clears throat> as a sort of normal Polish person 
a label had been affixed to him, and that label had all sorts of dehumanizing associations uh, through Nazi ideology. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, that's an example, again, of reification. Uh, what do we do about it? Well, Holocaust education, genocide education is all about trying to de-reify, to look at the histories, to understand how we come to have these reified ways of thinking. And again, with genocide education, Holocaust education, you know, it's obviously there's huge anti-Semitism, but it also can be directed as Islamophobia. Uh, I mentioned before the snake, you know, the snake can be directed against many groups and Trump often and in February used it uh, to talk about, uh, you know, a mosque like terrorists. So again, uh, you know, this is always the challenge, uh, ultimately the good, you know, the thing we aim for. Uh, but critical thinking is uncomfortable. It's not easy, but it's absolutely critical. And so when, just to finish up, when, you know, Adorno, he's a philosopher, notoriously difficult to read, he went on the radio. He spoke not just this time, but a number of different times and tried to communicate his ideas to a broad audience, because if we go back to it, right, what are the mechanisms we need to prevent Auschwitz? It's all about their different dimensions as well, because it links into social and economic structures. But it's about, in part, typification, essentializing, thingifying. And that is one of the key mechanisms that uh, lead to uh, lots of bad outcomes, including in the extreme uh, genocide and mass violence. Thank you so much. And I believe my colleague, uh, Professor Huggins, is coming on now. You know, as you mentioned, we've been exploring a lot of different topics and histories. Um, one thing we wanted to follow up on is the way that replacement connects to racism in the United States. Um, we, of course, featured. Um, you know, there was a depiction of Martin Luther King uh, last week on our campus, um, and the actor was uh, sharing from Letter from a Birmingham Jail. So that was our most recent source material, but we're also interested in, um, you know, what what your research tells us about racism today. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, and again, congratulations uh, on the initiative. Uh, very impressive. Um, so I included, uh, again, with the White Genocide Manifesto, uh, you know, which was written in the 1980s. Uh, Lane was influenced by uh, Pierce, who's in the 1970s, and said that he'd come to many of his conclusions in the 1970s. Uh, if we go back to, with Pierce, we get to the 1950s, American Nazi Party. We move into the 1960s uh, with uh, civil rights and desegregation. So we kind of temporarily move. So... One way to think about it is that, and again, this is back to fourth and with Adorno to de reify, we need to historicize. So we don't just think, well, you know, the far right extremists we see today are like the KKK. There are continuities, but there are differences as well. Uh, so if we look at, uh, you know, we take the Civil War, but we can also take the Civil Rights Movement uh, because we had Jim Crow, of course. Um, as a, a moment, uh, this is, you know, a bit of an oversimplification, but in a lot of far right extremist white power ideology, <clears throat> there's a, a demarcation where prior to that moment, a lot of the white power extremism was devoted, uh, for example, to uh, terrorize the black population, and it still is in a different way to enforce, if we go with Isabel Wilkerson's uh, idea of caste, the caste-like structures, right, that link into race in the US to uphold that order, to enforce it. So it was directed at subjugation and preventing rebellion from below. <clears throat> After the civil rights movement, and it's complicated because we have different currents, we get the Eichmann trial, we get the emergence of a focus, for example, on the Holocaust. We have the uh, war in the US, right? The conflict in Indochina, the Vietnam War. We have veterans coming back. Suddenly they're being labeled as traumatized. And by that, I don't mean they're not traumatized. I'm saying that word is newly invented around, you know, the, uh, I think it was right in 79, 80. Um, it's something everyone takes for granted, but actually it didn't exist if you go back 50 years. But the reason I mentioned this, uh, as you begin to get an emphasis on victimization, 
the word genocide has been coined. It's starting to be used more. Um, and so you get these discourses of grievance and victimization, which catalyze a flip from subjugation, um, excuse me, from supremacy and upholding an order to feeling subjugated as if, you know, status privilege, the caste like structures uh, that promoted uh, white power are all rapidly slipping away. And so <clears throat> you have this shift uh, from supremacy to subjugation, but it's it's now the white population that's being victimized. And so you get the victim discourses, which are very different. So, you know, I showed with uh, Lane, he talks about, you know, ultimately the Zionist occupied government, uh, plotting of Jews to orchestrate the diminishment of the white race through desegregation and all those things that we associate with the civil rights movement, busing, uh, you know, which the calculus kind of breaks down a little bit. It can be the sort of white civilization, uh, but there's also the, which, are, you know, the thing at, at root, which is the diminishment of the white race through miscegenation or abortion is another policy. <clears throat> so, you know, in terms of replacement, that's a thread that emerges directly in response to uh, what's taking place in the civil rights movement. Uh, and, you know, this continues uh, into the present day, great replacement. People are worried, oh, the white race is going to disappear. Now, one little caveat. So, you know, so everyone says demographic trajectory, white race is going to diminish. Uh, it's just the way it's going. Well, historically, obviously, race is a social category, right? It's a construction. It's a porous category. So if we went back to the 1850s, 1840s, uh, you know, people from a different race were pouring into the U.S. They were called Irish. Later on, there were members of a different race pouring in. They were called Italians. Yeah, so then, you know, these are categories that shift and change over time. But again, people don't historicize. They don't understand that. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll leave it there. But it's the sort of key ideas. You have this movement from uh, supremacy to subjugation. Uh, and the rhetorics and the way they play out. Uh, and you get these victim discourses that are much more pronounced in response to the civil rights movement. You know, uh, maybe before, uh, one other thing in terms of the arts, I just want to get this in because I know our time's kind of running out a little bit, maybe. <clears throat> um, in terms of, uh, you know, art versus the stuff I'm talking about, how does it connect? One way it connects is because art is able to contain dualities and be evocative. Uh, so if you think of, you know, and I was going to talk about Toni Morrison and her Nobel Prize address, um, where she tells the story of the bird in the hand. Uh, and in that story, there's some youths who come to an old woman, wise and blind somewhere, maybe in Africa. And they say, you know, tell us, blind lady, what's in our hand? And she thinks about it uh, and she says, oh, well, I don't know, but it's your responsibility. And then she, so she begins once upon a time and says a little bit. Then she goes again, once upon a time. And she tells that then a little bit later uh, she goes and so she kind of shifts into her own persona. So again, creative nonfiction, you write in a persona, you don't necessarily write as yourself. So she's writing in a persona um, and she's talking about status language, racist language, the type of language uh, that, for example, the snake embodies, which is a ideological diminishment, reification of other sorts of people that doesn't allow any ability to think in different ways. It doesn't provoke thought. It tells you what to think. It reifies. So back to Toni Morrison <clears throat> with the bird, you know, I always think of the bird and the snake, right? There's two different ways to do it. Uh, then she does once upon a time, a third time. And she retells the story. She's talking to friends, hey, these kids came over and they were trying to harass me and trick me. And they said, well, what if they weren't trying to trick you? And she begins to retell the story. And then she reimagines meeting the youths and not thinking they were out to get her and they have a conversation. They wanted her advice and they have a dialogue together. And so within this Nobel Prize speech, it's, it's, it's amazing. You have, right, all of these different things going, but the bottom line that I'm trying to get here in terms of art, performance, and these different moments of reification, right, periods of history that you're looking at uh, through uh, 
through these uh, performances, right, is it's countering reification precisely by being evocative, containing multiplicity, getting people to critically self-reflect. Um, so anyways, that's one of the reasons I included that current because I wanted to speak to the power of art and how it also is opposed to modalities of thinking, ideology, political rhetoric, left, right, and right, to be fair, right? This is what politicians do. They tend to reify. They want to create us them rhetorics that posit us versus the them who we don't want to vote for. And then we portray them as evil, dangerous, uh, so on and so forth. So art, you know, has that's what's incredible. And as her Nobel Prize address shows, this capacity of openness to be evocative uh, and to complain to get people to think. So mouse does not end. Mouse actually ends. Mouse is the graphic narrative I mentioned before. It doesn't have one ending. It actually, in the last page, has three different endings. And then it ends with a gravestone that points back up into the book, into the text. Mm -hmm. So again, Avaka, yes. so, you know, all the, all the more thanks, uh, you know, to all of you for bringing the arts into this because it's absolutely uh, critical. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinton. And I actually wanted to invite Julian up also to offer a question to you. And it is a very fitting um, to, to bring another writer into the group. Hi there, Dr. Hinton. Um, uh, thank you so much for this presentation and all of your remarks. Um, so uh, as far as the LGBTQIA consortium um, in partnership uh, with the performance uh, as prevention with uh, the KHC, we have presented a screening event um, about queer people in the Holocaust, um, a play that I wrote, Julio Ain't Going Down Like That, uh, which is um, surrounding how a community reacts after the brutal murder of Julio Rivera. Um, in Jackson Heights in 1990, as well as the documentary that inspired um, uh, my play, which is called Julio of Jackson Heights by Richard Spunt Spuntoff. Um, and we have, it's been, doc it documents violence, just like you were saying, art has a way to transform and, and transcend. Um, and it documents the violence against the queer community. And I'm wondering, how does replacement theory help us to understand homophobia and transphobia? And I want to connect it to um, a question that's also in the chat, um, who is asking, um, as a medical professional, um, Diane says, as a medical professional, who is serving our most vulnerable transgender communities? And what recommendations do you have for prevention? I'd say, uh, you know, two good questions, uh, interlinked questions, and certainly ones that speak to the moment. Um, you know, because I, I knew I was speaking, right, in terms of the different, uh, the different uh, performances that you've had, including yours, thank you very much as well. Uh, remarkable. Um, you know, I, I sort of wove part of, right, the, my response to that in my comments with Lane, the sort of, and they're, they're different, there's a different calculus. So there's one calculus of replacement <clears throat> that's directly linked to white supremacy, white power ideology that we see in Lane. <clears throat> and we get the notions of, uh, you know, quote unquote, de-gen, gene, degeneracy. <clears throat> and it has this calculation of not enabling propagation. So at CPAC, that for the conservative political action conference that I go to, which is heavily Christian. Uh, and I think fair to say uh, there's a very strong Christian nationalist component. So what's Christian nationalism? <clears throat> Christian nationalism, you can think of it as an alignment, you know, as the word says, between Christianity, the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition, and the nation, saying that there should be parallel. There are hard forms. And again, uh, soft forms of it, uh, one is that there should be a loose alignment because there were sort of values at the very beginning that created a moral order. The harder version is when people, uh, this just took place last month, or wait, we're in, sorry, a month and a half ago when I went to CPAC, God created men and women, right? And they're supposed to create God's children. It's unnatural to do otherwise. And almost always the invective, there's a strange thing. So at different times, you know, gay marriage was an issue at CPAC. And last year, uh, this guy, Michael Knowles, <clears throat> spoke. He got a lot of press. Maybe you 
heard about it. He talked about we need to eradicate transgenderism. Uh, and so this sparked a lot of, yeah, so you got that rhetoric. Uh, this was last year. This year, he had a much more tepid remark. Uh, he was critiqued. Um, but in, the, you know, so that's sort of linking into the replacement white genocide rhetorics. But what was interesting is, you know, in doing that framing, he was saying, well, we conservatives are a bunch of losers. We keep fighting these battles. We give in and changes. And of course, in that list of what's going on, he mentioned gay marriage, which at CPAC is completely now pushed sort of in the background. And all of the attention is now on gender, on gender pronouns, the number of pronoun jokes last year that I heard, you know, and people's making uh, statements like, I know what a, I'm a man, I know what a man is, and I'm a man, I know what a woman is, I'm a woman. Like people last year were saying that nonstop. This year it's shifted somewhat. Those like, that's still there. But the focus now is going to be on uh, border invasion and all the associated things that we should be familiar with from 2018 uh, and other points. And on political persecution, and this is kind of hard for people sometimes to understand, but MAGA supporters view the rat, this is quote unquote, the radical left as a bunch of socialist, fascist demagogues. So you have this weird portrayal on the left of people in the MAGAverse, but they have the same portrayal of people on the left. And they are godless people who are implementing a socialist agenda. And the only hope is through a savior. And that savior is Donald Trump. In fact, if you look at the New York Times, uh, you know, I wrote about this in CPAC uh, and an article in the conversation and <clears throat> the title, they always choose the title, but the title was like, uh, Trump is our savior. That was part of what I said. You know, I talked about apocalypse as well, but that now is in the New York Times today, I think. And they talk about how Trump draws on religion and these different rhetorics. There was an op-ed and a, they time op-eds and articles. <clears throat> so they just, uh, anyways, this is coming out. But this is, you know, absolutely at the center of it. This Christian nationalist and the Christian nationalist. And I'm, I'm not saying everyone at CPAC is a Christian nationalist, but there are a lot of Christian nationalists. And there's some white Christian nationalists as well, though a much smaller number those currents run through it. Um, in any event, so, and I, I was going to read you, it's not worth it. The stuff that's right now, especially with Easter and the overlap, with the, I mean, the stuff that's pouring through the so far right social media, you can imagine, I can't even say the things that are on there. I, I was going to put some on my PowerPoint. I said, no, um, it's nonstop. Proud Boys, especially with their hardcore masculinity, the, the trans issue is just nonstop, plays on this photograph. You get libs of TikTok. You may know that channel. Some may be familiar uh, who spoke last year at CPAC. Um, yeah, it's ongoing. It's pervasive. It's dangerous. Um, I wouldn't say the only good thing, but the amount of animus directed against the trans community last year had abated somewhat, but was still there. The flip side is, guess it's going to the border, right? I mean, that's that's going to be the target. Uh, so Trump would talk about, I, I began before, border invasion, the other part of its deep state, lawfare, persecution of Donald Trump, who is like Navalny. And the Stalinist regime is not people on the right. It's Joe Biden's criminal, quote unquote, criminal gang, uh, deep state, lawfare, so on and so forth, who are going to on the brink of utterly destroying the country. And that's really hard for a lot of people on the who lean to the left to understand because they're not exposed to this. But there's this weird mirror, you know, uh, accusation in the mirror, they sometimes call it. But it's very intentionally picked up as a discourse. Um, sorry, I went on a little bit long. The second part of the question was recommendations. Uh, you know, I, I, it's a great question. I'm not really positioned to answer it, I think. Maybe the person who asked the question is better positioned, <clears throat> but it's an absolute crisis, right? These changes of policies, especially midstream, 
I mean, it's it's insane. And there's just, again, we're back to the politicking, reification, creating us them divisions, creating notions of the degenerate other versus us. So ultimately, you know, we sort of bring a full circle that we have replacement discourse, but even notions of deviance and normality as a more general category are constantly, are related and constantly being deployed. And what's difficult, and this, this is the challenge, there are many challenges for all of us, but one of the challenges is that ultimately, if you will, we are all reifiers. Human beings reify. We can't think. We have to have categories to think. We build schemas. We think in terms of categories. We parse the world. We go insane if we didn't have them. And so the challenge is to constantly be vigilant to this, which is really hard to do. And I'll just end with this, with uh, Adorno in his essay, uh, Education After Auschwitz. Uh, it's all over the web if anybody wants to, <clears throat> to read it. Um, but he just had the Eichmann trial, right? This is in the late 60s, 67, 68, something like that. Eichmann trial, of Adolf, for those who don't know, Adolf Eichmann uh, was a Nazi bureaucrat who was tried. There was a famous book. Eichmann in Jerusalem that came out by Hannah Arendt, who I like talking about sometimes as well, but didn't have time today. Um, but he, and he harkens back to the authoritarian personality. And he's talking about Eichmann. And he goes, I, you know, I need to say it, but I really shouldn't say it. And so, but, you know, I, I have to say it even though I can't really say it and I shouldn't be saying it. So he couch, and then he talks about the manipulative character. So he prefaces it by destabilizing the reification he's about to make. He never solved this. This was the big paradox. And just to finish, in case some people, is the term reification, philosophical, you know, it sounds like a distant term, thingification. Here's how he explained it once in a real crystal clear way. He said he was in the States and a <clears throat> administrator, I think, at a university said, Professor, Professor Adorno, are you an introvert or an extrovert? And he said, in that moment, she wanted me to take the full complexity and all my humanity and to reduce it down to a one word caricature. Now, most of us, right, I, I confess, I've I've said something like that before. I've talked about introverts and extroverts. I grew up in a family where my father was a Jung, Carl Jung psychiatrist, and types tests were, you know, I was constantly required to take a types test. But you know, these are words we use all the time. And so the reification is this tendency, even as we need categories, to constantly question those categories, to constantly recognize them we use them. We're erasing the humanity in some sense or diminishing the humanity of a person we're talking about. And it often can be extremely dangerous because it's easy to think in terms of reifications. It doesn't require, right? And this, again, to loop back is the challenge, for example, for those who critique the people uh, at Charlottesville is a bunch of racists and haters. No, that's a reification. If we're saying, oh, it's an individualized quality of racism, right? They're racist. What aren't we looking at? Structural racism, the history of racism, right? We erase that complexity. So, it, you know, even though, and again, half of my work is on the far, far left extremism, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, and I work on far right extremism, you know, reifications for everyone, left, right, and center. It's a challenge for all of us. Uh, and, you know, you know, again, education after Auschwitz need to know the mechanisms, reification is a mechanism, and it's everywhere. Thank you, Dr. Hinton. You know, I think um, we have one more kind of two-parter to, to close out today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with all of us. I, you know, I want to acknowledge that we're gathered here to get today with community members and students, and so many folks may be curious about how you arrived at your path of study um, how you uh, were inspired to take this on, and and also just any advice that you may have for them um, for working with this moment. I, I know I've heard you talk about the importance of critical thinking, and I know you are an advocate of education, as you continue to say, but if there's anything else you would just want to add um, that we take with us 
in terms of how you found your path um, or guidance for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm, I could go on a long time. What's the the path? Uh, well, maybe I sort of gave a beginning of the path, right? As you know, I, I think about this. I'm I'm often asked, how can you study that? And often it's like, oh, what kind of person studies genocide and bad stuff? You know, or like, oh, you know, why do I study this? You know, anyways, but I, you know, I've thought about it and how, how can you study it? Right? It's not easy to study. The hardest chapter I ever wrote was about a Khmer Rouge torturer. And I was in the torture manual, transcripts from inside the torture chamber as instructions went back and forth, like that, that wears on you. We actually have, uh, I can't remember, my most recent book is called Perpetrators. And I co-wrote with a colleague, Tony Robin. Actually, I talk about some of the history in there. We both do. Um, and we talk about interviewing perpetrators. He works in Argentina, uh, you know, and I was doing Cambodia. And then we talk about dreaming. Uh, he's a psychological anthropologist. I'm I like psychological anthropology as well. Um, and part of the book came out of he saw I had written about a dream. Um, and so he did therapy in Argentina because Argentina, of course, is famous for for everyone gets therapy, right? So he said, "I'm in Argentina. What am I going to do? I'm going to do go into therapy twice a week." Uh, so he was doing it there. Um, I talked about a dream, but also more broadly, I have a chapter called Ruin. And it plays on the sense in which studying this, you know, kind of ruins you. And it talks about the philosopher Julius Kristeva. Uh, you know, it's hard to do. But then, don't get, it's not too bleak. I, well, it's somewhat bleak. Uh, the next chapter is called Curation. And it's about healing, right, through the creation of art, if you will, um, or through curating a writing project that we're doing. Uh, so that's sort of the transition out of that. Um, but to sort of loop back and I'll stop with this part of the question because uh, I know we're, I think we're a little bit over time. Uh, you know, I think in childhood with my father, who's a union, you know, I was constantly ultimately being analyzed, you know, when my images, my father has a beer going like this, mm, you know, and I asking questions, uh, you know, those are strong memories. Actually, we would talk about our dreams. Um, but I think there was also in a way the, actually my mother loved to use this term, there's a Jung concept of the shadow, um, you know, and so the discourse in the family was always like, you know, what's that person's shadow or that event is shadowy. It was just like a discourse. But I think what that meant was we were constantly attuning and sort of developing an ability to contain stuff that wasn't so nice. So it wasn't like, oh, I went down to school. There was no talk of school. Nobody cared what I did at school. What's your dream, right? <laughs> what did you analyze? So there were no sort of commonplace narratives, but instead, you know, I think I gained both, I began to gain an interest uh, and an ability to grapple and deal with this material, even as I would flip forward into the present. You know, that's part of the therapeutic method is that you don't, individuate would be the union term, right? By repressing a bunch of stuff that's unpleasant, you got to deal with it and you work through it. Uh, Dorno has another essay, Working Through the Past, which is uh, as a little call out to that. You have to work through it. You have to be able to contain these difficult things and work through them. Uh, and so I think, you know, I, the story is much longer, but that's the beginning of the story. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, I should say for the last question, uh, you know, what could say education after Auschwitz, you know, ultimately everyone, this is critical for everyone, right? It's not particular to the Holocaust. It's not particular to Cambodia. It's not particular to far right extremism in the U S it's something that's linked to the human condition. And that's ultimately what, for example, Adorno is arguing in that. We're all, you know, to go back to our reifiers. But there's also, you know, to end, you know, and that is a hopeful note in a sense because there's something we can do about it. We can critically self-reflect. We can learn to think, right? And that goes back to Hannah Arendt, 
the banality of evil. People think, oh, she's talking about a desk, no, a desk bureaucrat. No, what she was talking about, Eichmann was thoughtless. He had a failure to think. He didn't engage in what she called later the Socratic two-in-one, like a Socratic dialogue. You do that in your mind. You think through an issue. Then you go into the public sphere and you talk to people. So everyone knows what it's like to talk in a situation where people are just yelling about their opinions and there's no substance to it. For her, no, you need to come in with a critically reflective perspective that you then would dialogue in a serious way with other people. Afterwards, you would listen, you go back and you do more of the two in one. So in college, hopefully in, in life in general, through what we're reading, that's the challenge is for us to constantly be thinking critically. And it's not, it's uncomfortable. It's not easy to do. The one little bit of hopefulness I'll give you is that a lot of people feel horribly about the election and the prospects. Um, you know, and I'm having done research in Cambodia. Anytime I feel down about the U.S., I always just think about Khmer Rouge, Cambodia. Our system is so, the structures in place, even after the buffering we had before, are really strong. This is where the paradox of bureaucrats, people, you know, you've got like Eichmann is a Nazi bureaucrat that can, and that's part of modernity and abstraction and instrumental reason can do all these bad things. But bureaucrats also preserve the order. And bureaucrats are, and that's why, and well, and the dangerous thing is, well, I, I won't go off. I, I think we're probably out of time, but our system, I think, is stronger than people realize. And so as people get down, you know, and this, again, apocalyptic rhetoric on the left and the right on both sides, you know, these are populist politicians who are hyping this up. We have a remarkable, incredible system, uh, and, you know, it's going to hold. I think it'll hold. It may be challenged as it was, but it will hold. Uh, but I, everyone should go and do their own critical self-reflection, but look at history, denaturalize, uh, and hopefully we'll all get to a better place. Dr. Hinton, um, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing so freely of your time and your expertise, and also for those words of wisdom and hope. I can say, uh, you know, on a personal level, it is very hard to do this work right now and not feel just overwhelmed by it. And I think that you're talking about critical thinking and in a way you, you've able, I think you've articulated something about coming through the middle path in a way. And that's something that at Queensboro, we're also trying to help our students reflect critically and not necessarily say it's one way or the other, even though things feel very extreme. And I want to thank Professor Huggins and Professor Jimenez and everyone today who joined us for this really powerful discussion. Thank you all so much. We hope you stay safe and well. Thanks everyone.